Hello there, my name is Omar Janji and welcome to this special interview on The Chronicle. My guest today is Matar Mboch. He is the assistant coach of the senior national team and the head coach of the Gambia on the 20. So today we are here to talk about uh, his role as the assistant coach of the national team and uh, as we approach the qualifiers proper going into the uh, Group D games to Cameroon 2021. And of course, a big of his role as the head coach of the under 20. Matar, thank you so much for uh, giving us this time. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you for the uh, So let's begin with the uh, Djibouti game. Yeah. We went to that game with high hopes. And uh, But first of all, how did you read the game? How did you analyze the game? Yeah, we did um, the analysis after the first match, um, looking into the fact that it was an away game. Uh, and listen, we looked at a lot of different factors. We explained to the boys that playing away in Africa, no matter who the opponent is, is very difficult. Um, anyone who saw the game knew uh, the challenges we had, starting from uh, the referee. There were a number of different obstacles we faced as well, but listen, they're not excuses. Um, nine times out of ten, um, the Gambia um, should be beating G uh, Djibouti. Um, it's not to disrespect them, but it's just looking at uh, sort of the level of, uh, of, of where we have, where we come from looking at different things like FIFA rankings. Yeah. I think for the first time we've turned around and we've been the underdogs. Um, usually we are the underdogs and the first time we came and played an opponent that, where we are the favorites. And uh, I think the mindset potentially was a challenge for us to accept as well, because it's a different game. If you come in as an underdog, you can come in with no pressure on you. The opponent expected to beat you, but then the tables were turned against us and we were the ones expected to dominate and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and beat Djibouti by even more than one goal, by, by several goals. So uh, it didn't pan out that way in the first game. Uh, the adjustments were made for the second game. Uh, lots of chances made. Um, uh, you, would, you would say, of course, we dominated the match. And if we were, everybody saw the game, if we were more clinical, we potentially could have had more chances. And I think also uh, you have to credit Djibouti. They've come a long way. Um, they've... Um, organize themselves a lot better and and what they presented obviously was a team that's completely different to the team that usually you loses five nil or six nil um, they came and they got the early goal which obviously helped them as well to gain that confidence but we came back and uh, i think i think in terms of the two games um, to not come out of come out with a win is of course disappointing um, but the fact that we've passed through the group stage is the most important thing mm. yeah what do you think should have been done to have a win against Djibouti at home uh, it's 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 difficult to say. I think, uh, you know, as the te on the technical bench, we we discuss um, the head coach. He doesn't just consult me; he consults different people. And uh, I think, in terms of um, looking at the game, how I saw it, we needed potentially somebody like a, a Yusuf Injai maybe to come with the bench, mm -hmm. um, someone with a bit more um, ball control, someone who with a bit with a vision, with a bit of quality. Listen, uh, we were forced to make some changes as well in terms of um, injuries and, and, and different things. So uh, we were just unlucky in, in that sense. But I think in terms of um, the players, I think they just need to have a look in, and start saying these chances they keep presenting to themselves, they need to make sure that they, they, uh, they take them away uh, and, and look at the chance that you will not get another opportunity. I think sometimes as a player, when you're, when you're playing so well, and you can see you're obviously on top of the opponent that you become a bit complacent. Maybe you think, OK, another chance will soon come and I'll get I'll take that chance. Um, but then when those chances keep coming and you keep on missing them and time runs out, then it's that's that's also an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, the coach taking decisions uh, like introducing players and even taking on plays without consulting you as his immediate assistant. But why? It's, it's strange. No, he, he did he did consult. Um, as I said, he consults a lot of people on the bench, and this is why. Except you. No, he, he, he will consult me, but there's other people also on the bench who he also consults. Just to give you an example, for the first change, he spoke with the, the team manager was also in the vicinity, and he took a recommendation from the team manager. How relevant is he in the team position? Uh, no, it's, 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 you have to ask the head coach in that, in that sense, and you have to look at a lot of different things. Um, I think in terms of the Gambian mentality mindset, you know, you would expect the assistant head coach, someone who's qualified, who's been um, coaching for a number of years, 
you know, I sit down in, in my office majority of the day and even at home I, I watch players, I, I understand what they can give, I know what they give in their clubs and uh, I, would, I would think that potentially um, what I have to say uh, would hold a bit more weight but it's, it's, it's not always the case and I think it's time that people sort of understand that. The head coach uh, takes opinions from everybody, he will ask a lot of different people what he should do and at the end of the day he's the one who has to take the final decision. Yeah. When did he ever take decision from you or advice, seek advice from you when it comes to bringing in players or even taking on players? Uh, this, this happened on several occasions. I mean, we've worked for one year uh, and I'm very conscious of the fact and I, I appreciate the fact that the coach has said that I'm one of the best assistants he's worked with, if not the best. Uh, he's recommended me to do my UFA license in Belgium and also Ireland. He, he wrote a very good recommendation for me. So I think in terms of he does trust me, he trusts my uh, opinion, my input, but I think in terms of along the line, something is, has got mixed up and, 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 and confused matters. So in order to make sure that he comes up with the best decision, he will consult different people. And as I said, yeah. at the end of the day, he's the head coach and he's the one that has to make the final decision. It's his job on the line. Um, you know, you said that I'm assistant head coach, but it's, I'm not contracted as, as the assistant head coach. I'm contracted as the U20 coach. So when I'm there as the U20 head coach, the decisions that I take, I will consult, obviously, but I fully know that I am the one who makes the final decision. Yeah. And now, after a couple of years as the assistant coach for the national team, uh, tell us your vision I and mean, your philosophy as the, uh, for the Scorpions as the assistant coach uh, uh, and the fundamental reasons why do you think the team has been falling short to, to qualify in all these major, major, major events. Yeah, as you've said, um, I've been assistant to a number of different coaches. And, and I think for me, um, looking in the future, uh, immediate future, I've got this engagement with the U20s. So I'm not going to be working as assistant coach uh, on, on, on that occasion because the dates clash. Uh, and I've been asked to concentrate on the U20s to come through. Looking back, I think we are doing a lot of things very well. The only thing that's lacking is that, uh, is that patience. Um, I told you earlier, it's, it's, you are more comfortable and we as a team are more comfortable when we are playing as underdogs. You know, we go through the, the camp in Morocco playing two teams who are going to the AFCON, Guinea and Morocco, and we have nothing to lose. We know that they should be the ones to beat us. And when we are winning and sc scoring goals uh, and, and winning the matches, it, uh, it, it creates that, that feel-good factor. But we have to understand that the mentality of being an underdog is different to being a favorite. I think we have to start uh, being able to handle the expectation. Um, it's, it's the team's fault because the team has done so well, <laughs> you know, it, with pass results, so that brings its own expectations. So you're expected to do better, um, but maybe um, it's an expectation that we, we cannot, the team cannot match yet. And I'm sure in time, uh, given a bit of patience and support um, from, 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 from the government, from the fans, if we all get on side, I'm sure, inshallah, the Gambia will definitely reach the AFCON. Uh, we'll come there. But what decisions do you routinely take, routinely take as the assistant coach uh, of the Scorpions? None. I mean, we have a head coach. Um, I also work as uh, the national team administrator, so a lot of the things like invitations, um, I will send them because I have contacts with the uh, email address of players. I've, I will be the one to contact the clubs, for example. Um, I have to be aware of the FIFA rules on release of players and different things like that. Um, but in terms of the decision, I am always giving advice. The final decision is always the head coach. It's the same uh, at, the, at the U20 level. Mm -hmm. I have a team that will give me recommendations. They'll ask me how to, to do certain things. Oh, how about this? Try this. Think about this. But I will always turn around and I will always be the one to make the, the, the decision. I think. One of the reasons why we and uh, Tom said that we work so well is that he said that uh, he hadn't had an assistant who always challenges him. You know, he's, he's, he doesn't like to work with yes men, he, you know, as, and I think as an assistant, you should not be a yes man. Mm -hmm. You should be able to challenge the head coach. If he says A, you should ask him, okay, have you thought about B? Have you thought about C? And just give him alternatives and food for thought. At the end of the day, you are not there to make the decision for him. You are there just to, to help. Um, and give him as much information as possible so that he himself can make the correct decision uh, at, at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. What's your philosophy on recruitment and overall yeah. call-ups yeah. for the national team? Yeah, I think it, for me as a coach, you have to look for players that fit into your philosophy. Um, for the 20s, last time out, we were a team that 
wanted to possession of the ball, that wanted to play front foot football. So if you look at the fact that it's a possession-based team, um, from the goalkeeper onwards, you look for players that fit into that into that template, into that model. You look for players who are comfortable on the ball. As a centre back, uh, to play uh, my philosophy to play in my system, you have to be comfortable on the ball. Uh, the same as a goalkeeper, because the goalkeeper is also part of part of the eleven, and is also the first uh, one of the first players that's used in the build up. So I think whatever your philosophy is you have to try to look and find players that can fit into that philosophy. It's much easier to do that um, for the junior teams because you have more time to work with them. At senior level, whatever your philosophy is, um, it's all about winning at the end of the day. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how, it's about getting the results because that's, that's the first team, it's the national team. And uh, if you could win every game playing a certain style, stick with it. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, then think about how you can change things and tweak things. It's not necessarily a case of abandoning things and starting uh, f from all over. But that's, that's me, that's personally my philosophy. That's what I believe in. But I know it's not, uh, it's not the same for, for, for every coach that's out there. What about yeah. Tom? Oh, you, you have to, you'll have to ask him. <laughs> well, you work together. No, all, uh, well, I remember asking him uh, out, of the, uh, out of 20 how he rates his defending. And he's, he told me 18 um, out of 20. But, that, uh, and, and I advised him that, you know, if you want to... Um, say defensive, defensive, defensive. It's not something that uh, people can can grasp and people can like. It's more organised, uh, tactical level football. And if you watch a lot of football in Europe, um, teams they set up they're hard to break down. You know, um, I'll give you an example. A lot of uh, matches we watch, people will say that okay, for example, Gambia against Djibouti, that Gambia was Liverpool and Djibouti was. Exeter or a team lower down, but no, sorry, we are closer to Exeter than we are to Liverpool. So I think in terms of um, the style of play that, that he likes, uh, he's, he's also said that he, he likes Serie A football, um, but for me, I'm somebody who, who enjoys Premier League football, all action football, front foot, front foot football. Um, you can say there's a different, uh, there's a clash of philosophies in a sense, mm. but I will take what I can, I took what I can from him in terms of Learning the defending side of the uh, football, defending side of football, because that is obviously an, an area that I know I have to improve on. Um, so that's not to say that he also didn't pick up some of the stuff from me. We, I think for for one year we, we work well as a team, but I think uh, going forward, um, he will he will have somebody else to work with. Um, we've enjoyed the time together. I've enjoyed it. I've taken what I can, and uh, but I think it's time that that he tries to implement his philosophy and 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 and, and takes what he can. Maybe if you have. An assistant who is always challenging you. Maybe you are not comfortable in making a decision, you, and especially somebody who you think highly of. Maybe you think I better go with him because if it goes wrong, then uh, I'm to blame. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens, in my in my understanding, my philosophy, the head coach is always the one to blame. Uh, when the twenties, when we got knocked out against Benin, you know, it's it's I was the one that picked the wrong team. I was the one that selected the wrong tactics. You know, it's it's the same. Um, one of my favorite quotes was from. Mourinho, who said that uh, when the team wins, the coach is part of the, the, those responsible. He's part of those responsible. But when the team loses, the coach is fully responsible because you are there just as that, as that shield. Um, especially at youth level, for me, I try to protect the players as much as I can. At senior level, it can be a bit different. It, it varies. You cannot let players get away with certain things at times. So you do have to go down on them. You do have to um, try to get more out of them. But uh, as I said, um, Maybe working with somebody who, who is always challenging and always giving you another option, maybe gives you too many options. So in the end, you're not too, not too, too sure what you should do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Group D at the corner, November, uh, the qualifiers proper begins yeah. Yeah. Uh, against Angola. A side that you uh, are aware of, and Gambia played against Angola, uh, both uh, first leg and the second leg. How is the Gambia preparing for the Group D proper? Many will say, is now the time or never? Do you believe that? Yeah, I believe. Um, but you know, the the guys who are responsible now. Um, unfortunately, I'm not. I'm out of the picture. Uh, I could just. I just give advice where I can. Uh, I think the group. It's it, it's football. Anything is possible. We saw the Djibouti game, and you know, everybody expected Gambia to beat them over two games. They managed to get a point. Uh, everybody expected us to lose inside Morocco. Uh, we managed to get three. Well, get get a win. Sorry, in a friendly match. We played inside Algeria, who became AFCON champions. They expected to beat us, but we ended up drawing with them twice. 
So it's all possible. I think it's important to start very well. So these two games are hugely important because they give uh, the they they paint the picture. They they start to paint the picture for the rest of the group stage. Uh, yes, there's not another game after this one until September, but to have let's say four points on the board would go a very long way into making sure that uh, Gambia we finally get to the Afcon. How do we go? How do we uh, before even going further? Where are we now? Are we preparing now? Where are we as a nation? Yeah, no preparations are underway. As I said, you've 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 caught me on the time when I'm not uh, working with the senior team. I'm concentrating on on the twenties. Um, we've got our training coming up this week, and there's there's a team of people. There's other people who are sort of looking and re are now responsible for looking at the national team. Yeah. I'm not I'm not I'm not part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are responsible of sending invitation to these players for national team. Yeah. Um, uh, did you start consulting with the head coach Tom? on how to call and who not to call for, for these uh, qualifiers? You know, he, he made his, his last selection, he made it, he didn't consult me. Um, Why? He, no, you'll, you'll have to ask him. You'll have to ask him. He sent uh, a list of players and uh, in terms of sending the invitations, I, that was just part of a role that I was playing before. But now that I'm with the U20s, I've been, I'm concentrating on the 20s, that's going to be somebody else to do that one. So. Potentially, he must have consulted somebody else, but all I can say is that he didn't, he didn't consult me for, 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 for this time. Uh, yeah. But why do you think this thing is happening between you and Tom? It's a guy that you started working smoothly together, yeah. but now things are not looking so much cool between you two. Two that's supposed to be working together nicely at the national level. Well, as I said, we've worked for over one year now. Uh, you know, All the positive results we've had, I've been there. Um, I've also been there for the negative. I think it just comes down to um, responsibility um, and, and, and the ethics of coaching. For me, as a head coach, I will never stand and I will never point fingers at anybody else but myself. And I've already told you, you know, why we got knocked out of Benin. We won the first leg 2-1. It was me who came up with the wrong tactics for the second game. It was me who came up with the wrong 11 uh, for, 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 for us to lose 2-0. Uh, if I could have the game again, I know exactly which tactic I would I would go go with, but that's not a guarantee to say that anything could have been different. Um, sometimes also um, we go we anal we analyze these decisions, the technical decisions too much, where we think that okay, if this if we change here, if we put this one on, then definitely this would happen. But that's not how football works. Um, I think that in terms of the relationship now, it's I think he feels that he needs to work with somebody else uh, if. If um, and I don't believe um, that he would turn around and say that it's my fault. I've not heard him say that, uh, and I don't believe he would say that because someone who you've worked with for one year uh, alongside you, who's who's backed you up, who's helped you, who's even 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 if I don't agree with something that uh, the head coach has said, I still when I go to the player, still when I go to anybody else, I say no. Okay, this is what's happening. Um, in terms of uh, how he comes about. Uh, in the future and who he works with, it's, it's, it's now up to him. Uh, I, I just, I even asked him to find someone, someone better, please, just somebody who you think can help you, who can advise you, uh, and who you think can do maybe what you thought I couldn't do for you. But it was a good relationship. As I said, uh, you know, I told him about the fact that I wanted to try to get my uh, A licenses. He recommended me, he gave, he gave me a glowing report to uh, to the Belgium FA and also to, to Ireland as well. So I think in, in terms of somebody who you hold in that high regard i don't think overnight anything can, nothing can 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 overcome that uh, so so it's it's just all, it's just looking forward to the future um, all i know is now I'm, my immediate focus is for the u20s there's a trophy to defend so in terms of that that's my immediate focus and i wish him all the very best in his engagements coming up and if he needs me for anything obviously i'll be i'll be there to to advise him as best as i can so yeah. gambi angola would you be in the bench, technical mm -hmm. bench? No, yeah, that, the plan is I should be in Guinea. Yeah, the, the, the tournament starts on the 14th to the 29th, so by the game, the game should be on the 13th, and we plan to arrive in Guinea on the 11th. So I'm, I'm, you, you will not see me on the bench. No. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about also the your discipline policy, mm -hmm. national team, not only 20 this time. When players, uh, you know, uh, get in trouble with the staff or even fail to turn up for national call-ups. What is your discipline policy as a coach? It's, it's, it's difficult to talk about because uh, you've, you've said it's the national team, but I'm not, I'm not the boss when it's, it's the national team. Um, 
the head coach's policy, you, you'll have to speak to him about that. Um, all I can tell you is that uh, uh, at, at my level, what we do and, and how, we, how we approach it, um, it people, can, people can make up their own minds about people who, uh, players who turn down call-ups, but in terms of the discipline and the policy, um, sorry if it sounds like I'm leading you on to something, but it, it, it's, it's just something that's, uh, that's in the domain of the head coach. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, the head coach, okay, okay, I understand that. There's no, there's no other issue. Uh, okay, I understand. That's a question for the head coach. Uh, so to tell me about uh, a situation where it was difficult for you to handle a player. It can be on the 20 or in the national team. How do you approach it? How do you do that? No, I think in terms of uh, professional football, um, you know, when you're the group of men, you know, lots of testosterone flying around, mm -hmm. tension can get can get heated, but I always try to behave um, in the best manner possible, in the best professional manner, um, because I, I, I try to empathize with the players. I want to put myself in their situation. So if I speak to them or if I act with them, I, I try to um, act in a way that, okay, this, how would I like them to talk to me? Um, there are situations where um, they will have their position, they will think that they are right, and then I will also have another position where I'm right. But we have a boss, we have somebody who's responsible for putting everybody in line and what he says goes. So whatever disagreements there could be with a staff member and a player or uh, two players or even the coach himself and a player, it's up to him to lay down the law, mm. stamp down his authority and make sure that any disagreements uh, are, are, are put, under the, put under bed and, and taken. Mm. You know, I, I can't be here uh, discussing things about fallouts of players or anything like that. But as I said with you, um, I always try to conduct myself in the most professional manner possible. Uh, we only conduct and we only know each other through football. You know, these players were not, you know, were not, uh, let's say, friends who I'll invite them to my house or they invite me to their house. It's a professional relationship. When we come, we try to do our best for the Gambia and then we go back to our families, we go back to our friends until the next time. Um, but as a coach, I also take pride in the fact that um, a lot of but players look up to me and they, they will text me from time to time and say, coach, how are you? And as a coach, it's important because uh, it's not always about the trophies you have in the cabinet. I value a player texting me and just asking me, how are you? How's it going, coach? Because that tells you that you've built up a strong relationship and you've left something in that player for him to contact you like that. Yeah. Are you able to build a relationship with the national team players now? Yes, yes, I'd, I'd like to think so. Uh, and going forward, I think... Uh, Whatever happens, I think I'm, I'm proud of the fact of the relationship I built with them. Um, a lot of them also, you know, when they when they are moving clubs, they will ask me, oh, what can you do? Can you help me with an attestation? Can you help me with this? Can you help me with the minutes I played? Can you help me with the goals I scored? I'm more than happy to do that. And it's my pleasure to do that. Um, also, this summer uh, and probably in January coming, you know, they asked me to compile some videos for them to see because I have we have all the software as part of the national team analysis when we analyze uh, videos. Um, they'll ask me, coach, have you got the game from last time? Can you put together something for me? No matter how long it takes for me, I'll, I'll do it for them because it's, 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 it's in Gambia's interest that these players, if no matter how big the club is, for them to move to a bigger club and then another player moves to a bigger club. We want, mm. you know, we want to see and we should see our players playing at the highest level possible. So if they come and ask me to help them with these little different things, I, I, I don't take it as a burden, I take it as my pleasure. Uh, and, and these are the things that have helped me to build up a strong relationship with them. Yeah. Uh, do you have any problem or issue with any player in the national team? Uh, I, I know where, where, where this was coming from. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about certain players. I, I can say that I've never had a problem with any player. Um, I can say that in terms of the public perception, I've kept quiet because it's maybe it's my own fault, but it's my professional manner. If people are accusing you of different things or talking, you just leave them to talk. But those players and myself, they know the truth. They know that if they score a goal, I will text them. They know that uh, relationships, when we were speaking before, you know, I've had players ask me, to, to, to look at their brother for the 20s and different, different things that are just all manner of different things where um, when I hear that I'm supposed to have a problem with those players and I'm accused of having a problem with those players, Which players? I'm just shocked. I, I, I cannot give names here. Maybe you potentially can give names better than me. Yeah, um, I think many are saying Bubakan Trawal and Steve is one of them. Okay, Steve is the first one that came out. Um, 
and I think in terms of setting the record, I want to set that record straight. Um, because I was his coach at Real de Banjo. Uh, he was one of the best players in the team, one of the most talented players. We had a lot of talented players. And uh, he helped me to have the first division title on my CV. So I don't think as a coach it's ethical to turn around and have any grudge or any personal problem with that player. He played every single game when I was there, um, apart from the last game, when I talk with him and I, I agree with him, we already won the league, you can stay on the bench. If we need you to come on, it's, we, you can come on. That was against uh, Ports, but by then we'd already won the league, like I said. Mm. I took him off in one match, um, because when I hear the player say that uh, he has a problem with me or there was a problem, the only incident that I can think of is the match against Bayern United, we were losing one and I took him off. Uh, he said something in the local languages, by then my wife was not so, so, so good. So I didn't understand what he was something saying. Like something, he wasn't happy to be taken off, <laughs> you could imagine. <laughs> but, but he said it in a language that I could not understand. It was not even Wolof, I think it was, it was, it was another language. And uh, of course, players, when you come off, you shouldn't be saying, you shouldn't be saying, yes, I'm very happy uh, to, to leave. So that's the only time. But straight after that game, he came to me and said, uh, coach, if you left me on for another 10 minutes, I would have scored. And I said to him, but, but Steve, I, tried. I left you on for 56, 50, 58, 60 minutes, however long it was, and you didn't score. The next day in training, uh, I addressed the whole group and I explained to him that I had a player who I substituted and he was using, he must have used foul language. And I didn't understand what he said, but he, he was shouting against me. I sat in front of the whole group and I said, listen, I forgive you. It's normal. Let's move on. Let's try to win the league. I didn't punish him. I didn't ban him from the team. I didn't send him away from training or anything like that. So I'm trying to think about what would be the problem with a player who I used where possible in my matches, even in friendly matches he played. Um, when I first came uh, as assistant coach, he, I was with Raul Savoy. He was in the team with Raul. I was there with him. When I was working with Sang, he was always cold. Um, there are accusations that he turned down invitations and that it was some sort of punishment for turning down invitations or something like that. But at the end of the day, he was not the only player that, was, that couldn't make national team engagements. So it would be very unfair to blame one player. So the only thing that changed was the head coach that we have now who came in and said that, OK, I have a player in China. And he explained in this press conferences, there's players playing in Europe. He wants to look at them first and use them first before bringing a player from China who can come and sit on the bench. That's the, that's the fact. And um, I, I, the reason why finally I can, and I'm, and I'm happy you've come and asked me this, Omar, because it's, I wonder where it comes from. Um, I was really shocked when I saw the player himself say that he has a problem with me. That was, that was when I realized something is wrong. Uh, because before I just thought, no, somebody's advising him, I think his brother, said something, some, all these other people who were representing him said all these different things. Um, but the player has to realize he's a, he's a talented footballer um, and he hasn't fulfilled his potential yet. If you look at where he's gone and, and where he should be, um, there, are, there are lots of players who I had in Real de Banjo and they're playing in professional leagues. It's not to say that Europe is, is, is the holy grail and, and, it's, and it's Europe or nothing. But when I look at him, uh, I don't understand why he's playing in the countries and the clubs he's playing for. He, he, should, he could be playing at a, at a higher and more competitive level. And I don't understand why um, his exclusion from the national team has something to do with a coach who was his head coach in a club level, who didn't have any problem with him, who selected him all the time. And now he's an assistant and there's another head coach. Now the blame should be put on the assistant. I think um, I just have to take this opportunity and I'm, and I'm glad you've come and asked me to, to try to clear the, the air with that one. Mm -hmm. have, so if you face Steve today, what will you tell him? I will ask him what he meant. Can, can you believe I've still not seen him? Since he made those comments, those allegations, my office is here, um, I go to games, I have not seen him. Um, and I also tried to reverse and I think to myself, if, if I was in his shoes, if I was a player and I think that the coach has a I would call him and, or I would confront him and ask him, yeah. why am I not playing in the national team? Why are you bringing Real de Banjo things to... But he's, he's, I've never seen him. I've never had the opportunity to see him face to face. And uh, if you talk to some of the players who I had in Real, they will all tell you the same thing. They said, 
when did you have a problem in Real? We, we don't know when it was because we were all there. You played every game. The, the coach never sent you away. There was even one week when we used to have uh, play of the week. Uh, and can you believe uh, he, he came late to training that day? Um, you know, we, we, we had a good game. We won 4-0. Uh, he came late to training that day. And uh, I was going to present him with the, with the Player of the Week award. And I said to him, oh, should I give it to him now because he's late? But in the end, I said, no, this is one small transgression. Yes, being, you should not be late as a player. But in the end, I still sucked it up. And I said, Torale, you are the Player of the Week. So, and then after that, he told me, coach, I'm going to win this every week. It's, it was motivation to him. Um, so I'm very proud of the fact that also I was the last coach he worked with. You know, coaches, we want to develop players. I want to see players playing in the highest level. Um, when we um, first came, when I first saw the team, uh, Troali had a problem with tracking back. That was his first away, first of all, his weakness. And he had to try to come back and help the midfield. I tried to ingrain in him tracking back and winning the ball. I explained to him that scouts, they will look at what you do on the ball. They'll be happy with what they see. They'll say, this guy is great going forward. But then losing the ball, if you're walking, if you're slowly jogging, looking like you're not interested, they will leave you alone. I explained that to him. And you know what? We're playing Hawks. We, we win the game. We're winning 2-0. Uh, you know, the game is comfortable. You would think, OK, let him jog around. He, he went from his position up front. He went to tackle a man, slide tackle. After the game, he came to show me, coach, you see the slide tackle I made? My skin is all off. I was proud of the, I, I was proud of the player because there's something that he, he understood from what I was saying. So for him, um, I understand other people around him to try to, uh, I guess, influence him for their own personal gain. But for him to turn around and say that, that somebody who, 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 who I tried my best to, to make sure that he, was, yeah, that he developed as a player on his weaknesses to the point where he was eventually sold and he was, became a professional. Before I came, he was going for trials here and there. And I just explained to him, the thing you're missing is this work rate. A scout just needs to see you make that tackle where you have a, a, a scar on your leg. And he listened, he did it, and finally he went off. So, and we worked together in the national team on several different occasions with two, two different coaches. So it really, it really surprised me. But at the time, I was told, listen, you have to keep quiet. Don't be, uh, don't be distracted by anything. Allow these things to fester. Uh, people will forget about it. But still now, there's still something in the back of people's minds. So I just want to clear the air with that one. Again, Omar, I thank you for the opportunity because when this happened, no journalist came to speak to me when it happened. Nobody came to get my side of the story. They just went with one side of the story. And I think there's ethics in coaching, there's ethics also in journalism to try to get two sides of the story. And I'm glad that you've come to get my side of the story, at least on that issue. So apart from Steve, is there any other player that you have issues with, allegedly you have issues with in the national team? Uh, you tell me. You tell me. Are there? I don't know. No. I, for me, I don't have any problem. I think uh, um, the ones that came to mind maybe is Muru Barrow. Okay. Um, but I don't have any problem with him. I know that Muru has um, his own, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say issues, but he has his own reasons why the coach is not inviting him. You'll have to ask the coach why. Um, if all those issues are put to bed now, again, it's the responsibility of the head coach. Uh, I cannot be here um, Omar, as a head coach and say that I'm not going to invite these players because uh, the assistant will have a problem with them or somebody in my staff will have a, pro a problem with them. I will say to <laughs> the staff member, sorry, you're not the one going on the pitch. These people are more important, so I'm going to bring them so that they can deliver what I need on the pitch. No coach is going to sideline a player who they think can help them. Uh, no sane coach anyway, No, if you're in the right frame of mind. If you think the, the player can help you, if you think the player can deliver what you need, and help you win games, get results, you would call him no matter what. There is no obstacle to that. But do you think there was a reason why Tom was not calling Steve for, uh, for Morbaro? You, was... You'll have to ask him that one. I, because as I said, okay. uh, he's the head coach. Um, if, if I'm the head coach, uh, you, it's not to say it would be a completely different selection, but you wouldn't, we wouldn't have exactly the same uh, selections. People, people um, sometimes they're, they're under the illusion that that has, as head coach and assistant coach, you are just like this all the time. You agree all the time. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you for a fact that there are, there are disagreements. Mm -hmm. It happens. Okay. It happens. It's, it's normal. But it's the job. 
we are making sure that we get to the, the best possible conclusion. We're making sure that we get the best possible selection for the interest of gambling football to make sure that we come and we win games and we qualify the country. Right. Yeah. But in a, in a private conversation, mm -hmm. uh, did you ever talk with Tom or discuss with him about these two players, Steve or Moribano? Yeah, there was a time when I recommended um, for, for this. Like, they, were, they were picked for the Morocco camp mm -hmm. and there was a case of saying, OK, we've had the qualifiers for AFCON 2019, so now comes the time to pick players for the 2021. Let's open the book. Let's give everybody a chance to come and see what they can do. Maybe they'll prove you wrong. I said, uh, maybe you as a coach, they'll prove you wrong and they'll, and they'll make themselves, uh, I, I, I use the word, indispensable. So you, so you cannot drop them. So if they come, that means you cannot drop them. There are players who turned down the invitation. They didn't come and that's their reasons. Um, I messaged a couple of them and I said, listen, well, I haven't heard a reply from you. What's going on? Um, Trawale is the only one we didn't hear from, he didn't reply to us at all, but for Hamza and Muru they said that we excuse ourselves for this one. I said, are you guys sure? Muru, are you sure? You, it would be great to have you guys back. No, sorry, it's fine. Uh, we want to stay away, they want to stay away. Um, and um, I, I cannot defend them in that situation. I think we just have to move on and understand that these guys, for whatever reason, don't want to come and play. So let's work on the players who are here. And I, I, you, you can see the players who came to come up with two wins, two clean sheets against a team like Guinea and teams like Morocco, yeah. it's, it's huge. Uh, so if you go from there now as the head coach, it's, it's going to be difficult for him now to go back to those players again when they've already let him down, when he has a group of players in front of him who, when he called them, they came and they delivered. So again, it goes back to the, to the um, it's, it's nothing personal, it's nothing, uh, there's nothing untoward, there's nothing sinister, it's just purely footballing matters. You know, if, if, if I call you up to come and help me on, on the battlefield and you say you cannot come, I call your colleague, he comes and we, we buy, die together, then that's what, you, that's what you're going to have. You, you're not going to rely again on that person who already said no to you. And, and this was already explained to me. And when it, when it was explained to me, I, I, don't, I don't know what the comeback is. <laughs> you know, oh no, let's forgive them for a tenth time and let's forgive them again. No, it's... It's, the head coach is, has the right to select whoever he thinks can, can come to the squad and help him. And, we, and, and there are times when I just have to say, OK, that's, that's, that's your final decision, go for it. I, and I support it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what immediate changes would you like to see if you are hired as the head coach of the national team? <laughs> I think uh, it's a question for, for the future um, because I'm not uh, in, that, in that position. And, uh, yes, I have ide ideas, but uh, I prefer to use the forum that I have with the, um, my immediate bosses, my colleagues inside the federation to go and, and, go and, go and um, speak with them about it. But in terms of, I can talk about potentially... Um, the plans you have, no, the changes you want to see. No, I, I, for me, what I, what I would love to see is, and, and, and I think in terms of, you know, the fans when they come, I can understand they want the team to win, but it, it's, it's not always like that. And uh, when I go away, um, especially the Benin match with the 20s, yeah. even with the senior team, even when things are going wrong, the fans are still supporting. They support to the end. Our, our fans, in terms of the support, it's fantastic when they get behind the team, when we're doing well. But when they're, when they're three, four, five minutes, when things are not going so well, uh, it, it, it can be an issue. And it affects players. And players, that's how they become scared to play for the national team. Um, I always respect the players because there's so many people who want to play for the national team, but they don't have the heart, they don't have the guts, the bravery to come and face that full stadium, full to the brim and people demanding you to give your best, not only give your best, that's not enough, you have to come and win. And not everybody can handle that. So I think in terms of um, that psychological side, uh, we have to work with our players on, on, on having that bravery. We, we have a lot of them there already. But there's still a long way to go in terms of how they can fully um, phase out the crowd, come and play, do your business. Um, I think also when, 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 when uh, a home game uh, is, is in play, there's a lot of distractions for players. Um, that's just the way, we, that, that's the way it's been for a long time. Minimizing those distractions becomes almost your full-time job. But if if going forward there can be a way to minimize those distractions even further, 
then the players can come onto the field of play with a clear mind. Um, they're not too worried about things going on off the field, mm -hmm. and it will help in their performance. Yeah. yeah. You told me you will not be with, so. the, uh, with, the, with the team uh, in the Angola game, uh, but what more support do you need from the GFF administration for the team to be successful? Going into these qualifiers, I mean. What the GFF has done, um, and from what I can see, is as, as much as they can do. Um, it all comes down to finance. Uh, if you look at the likes of Angola, for example, after we played them, um, the first leg in Banjul, you know, we were there scrambling for flights by Casablanca. Even after the game in Angola, we ended up having to stay a couple of days. I think we played the game on Tuesday, and then Friday we had to, to leave back to Banjul because we couldn't get commercial flights. Mm -hmm. The Angolans came with, with, a, with a charter flight straight after the game in Banjul. They went back. It was difficult for them as well. It wasn't like uh, it was a smooth ride for them. They also had their challenges, but they made it possible. I think for us, we, we, we have to open up... Um, are thinking in terms of what we can do and what we think is possible. Um, don't look at football um, as something that, that doesn't need a lot of investment or uh, is, is, isn't important. It's, um, I always love Carlo Ancelotti when he said football is the most important thing of all the least important things. Mm -hmm. It's this in healthcare, education, these are all, you know, transport, these are all things that the government have enough on their plate for sports development and then football, it's, it's an area where Yes, we can see there are challenges. Yes, they have done so much um, in terms of helping uh, the Federation in, with the costs, with air tickets, with transport. But it's just to keep that momentum going. And eventually, I think um, we'll nearly be there knocking on the door to say that, yes, uh, we are a team that will qualify for AFCON and we are a team that deserves to be in AFCON. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm playing you and you're my, op my, my opponent and you have spent X amount of money on this match and I spent less on the match, in, in the eyes of the Almighty, it's not fair because you've come out and you've done everything you can in terms of that financial investment. So uh, I think we shouldn't be worried too much about the figures, what the numbers mean. Uh, uh, we should try to just give football its due, invest in it, and let's really go for it. Right. Because once we really go for it, with these players, I'm sure, um, no doubt, eventually we'll see Gambia the AFCON. Yeah. I'm talking about investment, uh, yeah. our game against Djibouti, or Gambia's game against Djibouti, I should say. How much of money was invested in the team? You'd have to talk to the finance guys. Um, how much did you demand as the team administration? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a, uh, th those figures are, I don't know how to say it. Um, it was agreed upon with the players. We came up with a, an allowance system for them um, where they would be paid every, every day. Uh, we also came up with a bonus system, but there were different things that they asked for that obviously we weren't able to to fulfill. But in terms of uh, what what agreeing to play and agreeing the the new the new structure, they were happy with it. Everybody was happy with it. Um, all the other things like accommodation, air tickets, those things. I, all all I would do is I would just get the list of the players. I would work out the city they're coming from. I would give the best possible route for them to travel as, as part of uh, this administrator role that I had, um, just to give them that comfort. But obviously, if I give a ticket that it's only a, a 10 hour journey, for example, if it's a 20 hour journey or 24 hour journey, then it's, and then, then it's a bit cheaper. So we, we, we sometimes have clashes in terms of that, that, that budgetary constraint. But we always try to manage as best as we can with players. Um, you know, going back to Djibouti, we wanted to go via Turkey. Uh, Djibouti came back via Turkey. We were not able to. We had a, a long mission to go to Doha, to go to Casablanca. But we tried our best in the, in the circumstances. We, we, we talked with the players. We convinced them to, to take the route. We made it a mission. We made it like uh, a thing where we're all together. Um, because obviously, after drawing 1-1 one, one in Djibouti, if, it, if people are down, we have to bring them up again and say, listen, it was fine. Considering all these circumstances, we did well. Let's go now to Banjul and finish the job. Yeah. All right. Now we are, we are, we are, we are, we are wrapping up very soon. But mm -hmm. Let's go ahead to this Group D, Gabon, Angola, and uh, DR Congo. Um, what is the way forward now? You talked about players that had issues. Uh, you clarified that with Steve and other players, more about on all this. But do you think the country needs them now for these for these for these qualifiers? And how yeah. will be the approach? Or what should yeah. be the approach of getting these players on board uh, for, for for these qualifiers? Can I just say about uh, Hamza? 
Um, Hamza? You know, I, no, I heard something about Hamza, and I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you here, that um, because I was part of the coaching staff when we played Central Africa at home, he wasn't happy at being substituted, and he thought that I was the one that said <laughs> to, that he should be taken off. Um, not knowing that as a front foot coach, you know, I wanted, another, I said another player should go off. But, uh, you know, as a, as a coaching team, we all have to come to a decision and we agree. Even when Hamza came off, I came to sympathize with him to say, sorry, you've been taken off. Um, and I've realized that that's something that uh, maybe he, he, he took it in the wrong way or something. Um, because of the final whistle, he was, it was him and another player that, that immediately ran straight to the dressing room. So you can tell that they were not happy about something. But at the end of the day, when he was called up against the Algeria and Tom's first game, he explained to the head coach that uh, he wants to concentrate on his team. And I think it was for over one year. Um, Hadjik Split is a very demanding club, uh, especially to play in Croatia. So he was excused for those qualifiers. Um, after, before the Angola game, I, I did say to the head coach that Hamza may be somebody I think we should look at in terms of uh, complementing the midfield. Um, eventually, he was called up for this game, these games against Djibouti. Uh, he sustained an injury. We got all the medical report and everything like that. Um, and he couldn't make it this time, unfortunately. Uh, so I don't, I don't know where uh, I would have any issue uh, with Hamza. Um, as I said, we, we speak on WhatsApp. We, we were speaking before on WhatsApp, sorry. Um, but for whatever reason, maybe he felt that uh, I was the one uh, again, everybody blaming the assistant again that I'm the one doing everything. So uh, I, I think it's unfair. I want people to judge me and my work as a head coach. Uh, I don't want people to blame me and accuse me of different things when I'm working as an assistant. And uh, my only job is to is to help whoever is the head coach. I, I prefer people to judge my work as a as a head coach. Okay. Yes. And coming back uh, yes, to the previous question is like, do we need them? Do we need this place? Many will say they are key to our qualification or to the country's qualification process. Do you think Gambia needs them, daily needs them to qualify for Cameroon? From, from a technical point, we, ha we have so many players out there. I think, uh, and I'll take a quote from uh, Honourable Coach, uh, who says that... Who's Honourable Coach? Uh, Alaji Sila. Uh, Alaji Sila. Sorry, I'm quoting all these other coaches, so let's, let me quote our own, um, who said that... Uh, you know, it's for him. It's about picking the right team, not necessarily the best players, um, because you could have uh, a lot of players who will, who will demand to be in the starting eleven, for example, who demand uh, service, and uh, yeah, it's 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 their right because you know they will feel that they are the very talented players. But for me, the most important thing is to have uh, a team yeah. where everyone is together. Um, if I could give a secret. Uh, sorry, in, indulge me about uh, for my U20s. The secret for the 20s was um, why we did so well in our tournament to to win a, to win the trophy was that they were really together. They were really together, mm. uh, even to the point where um, if they had any disagreements amongst themselves, they would sort it out before it got to me or to anything. It was like they were managing themselves, and when you have that as a coach, you can sleep at night. You that that is uh that's that's paradise for a coach because you know that you have characters in your team who will look after any problem makers any troublemakers any people who want to act above their station who want to act bigger than they are they have somebody to put them back in their in their place mm -hmm. and uh, looking at the squad that we've worked with in the last one year i don't have any complaints on that front to be honest they've been very good um they've been together uh, even when these guys uh Modu, Hamza and Steve, when they've been with the national team, it's been the same. They've, everybody's harmonious, uh, everybody gets along. So I'm sure those things will continue. And as long as, as long as the team is harmonious, as long as they're all getting along, as long as they're managing themselves, they're not allowing people to get more important than another, then things will be fine. It has been a pleasure talking to you, Matar. Okay. I will give you the chance to give your final words. Yeah. No, I think um, I'm very happy with the fact that you've come and you've um, offered me the opportunity to take this interview. Uh, and I think you've shed, shed a light and you've shown an example to people that uh, here is somebody who a lot of people talk about, but he doesn't talk. You know, I don't, I prefer to let my work do the talking and I prefer to, to not spend my time 
being distracted with other things. I prefer to be working um, because I feel that's the best way uh, that, that actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could have a message for Gambians, so let's support one another. Let's, uh, let's also try to get two sides of every story. There are always two sides. Mm -hmm. If a person says A, another person will have, uh, will have a different opinion. And uh, let's not be quick, too quick to judge or to make up our minds about something. Let's look at the evidence. I've already given you an example about the player in question who, you know, I was, I was his coach and we, I cannot think of any disagreements. So why now, outside of that, I would have, have a disagreement. Um, but, but, but anyway, I think, I think long may this continue. And if we have more of, of, um, of, the, of shining a light on these things, Gambia football uh, and Gambia by extension, we'll continue to move forward. Yes. Thank you very much. Mata Buj is the head coach of the on the 20 national team and of course the assistant of the senior national team. It has been a pleasure uh, talking to you and uh, that was the special interview here on the Chronicle. My name is Omar Jayu and thank you so much for watching.